You've probably seen it in your kitchen cabinet or at the back of an old recipe book. Thick, dark, and sticky. But have you ever stopped to ask, what even is molasses, and how is it made? So grab a spoon as we're going to discuss step-by-step step how molasses is made. It turns out molasses is more than just a baking ingredient. It's a byproduct of sugar production, used in animal feed, industrial alcohol, and even gunpowder. And the process of making it? It's hotter, stickier, and way more industrial than you might think. Molasses is not its own crop. It comes from other crops, mainly sugarcane and sugar beets. Sugarcane is a tall tropical grass, while sugar beets grow underground in cooler climates. Both are loaded with natural sucrose, and that's where the magic starts. Harvesting is the first step. Giant machines cut down sugarcane stalks or pull sugar beets from the soil. These are then washed, chopped, and shredded to release the juice inside. That juice is what's going to be turned into sugar and the leftover parts become molasses. A single sugar cane stalk is over 70% water, and from every 100 pounds of cane, you get around 12 to 14 pounds of raw sugar, but nearly 3 to 4 pounds of molasses. That's a lot of syrup left over from a process most people only associate with sugar cubes. Once the sugar cane or beet is chopped, it's time to extract the sweet liquid. Factories utilize heavy-duty rollers and hydraulic presses to extract every drop of liquid from the plant fiber. The juice that comes out is a murky, greenish liquid full of water, sugar, proteins, minerals, and plant gunk. Before it can be boiled, it has to be cleaned up. That's done through a process called clarification. Lime, also known as calcium hydroxide, is added to the raw juice. It helps tiny dirt particles and impurities stick together so they're easier to remove. After that, the juice is gently heated and left to sit in large settling tanks for about two hours. During this time, the heavy dirt clumps sink to the bottom while the clean juice rises to the top. This step clears out most of the unwanted stuff and gets the liquid ready for the next stage, boiling. Here's a question to think about. Before lime became the standard, what unusual material was once used to clarify sugar juice hundreds of years ago? Drop your guesses in the comments and we'll reveal the answer at the end. From this point on, things get sticky because the molasses process is all about boiling, reducing, and separating. Now it is time to turn the juice into sugar. The clarified juice flows into massive vacuum pans, which are large, sealed steel tanks. These tanks let the juice boil at lower temperatures so it does not burn. The boiling happens in three main rounds. After each round, sugar crystals are pulled out. In the first boil, the juice thickens and crystals begin to form. What is left behind is called first molasses. This version is the sweetest and the lightest in color. Then the syrup is boiled again. More sugar is taken out and what remains is called second molasses. It is darker, thicker, and less sweet. By the third boil, there is barely any sugar left in the juice. What remains now is blackstrap molasses. This is the thickest, darkest, and most packed with minerals. It has a bold, bitter-sweet flavor and is mostly used in animal feed or industrial products. Here's something surprising. Just one tablespoon of blackstrap molasses gives you about 20% of your daily iron. It also contains calcium, potassium, and magnesium, making it one of the most nutrient-rich sweeteners around. Let's back up for a moment. After each round of boiling, how do they actually separate the sugar from the syrup? The answer is spinning. Fast spinning. Once the syrup cools down a little, it is pumped into powerful machines called centrifuges. These are large drums that spin at incredible speed, up to 1200 revolutions per minute. Since sugar crystals are heavier than syrup, the spinning motion throws the crystals to the outer wall. The lighter liquid molasses stays in the center and gets drained out. Each spin only takes a few minutes, but the results are impressive. From just one ton of sugar cane, you can collect up to 60 pounds of molasses, depending on how much sugar was removed and how efficient the process is. And here's something unexpected. In some factories, they actually leave extra sugar in the molasses on purpose. This type is called fancy molasses or table molasses. It is sweeter, smoother, and perfect for baking things like gingerbread or adding depth to barbecue sauce. Now that the molasses has been separated from the sugar crystals, it is still not quite ready for the bottle. When it leaves the centrifuge, molasses is extremely hot, often over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the first step is to cool it down in large storage tanks. After cooling, the molasses passes through a fine mesh filter. 
This helps remove any leftover bits of plant material, crystal dust, or foam. The result is a thick, smooth syrup with that deep, glossy shine. Once it is clean, the molasses gets grated. Experts check its density, color, sugar content, and something called ash level, which tells how many minerals are still inside. Based on these qualities, the molasses is sorted into different types. Fancy molasses, regular cooking molasses, and the darkest one, blackstrap. Blackstrap molasses is so thick and dense that it can pour more slowly than cold honey. It is nearly black in color and rich in minerals. Before packaging, every batch is tested in the lab. They check the pH, sugar strength, and whether it is safe from bacteria or spoilage. Only after passing these tests is the molasses cleared to go on shelves. After the molasses is grated, it is either stored in large heated tanks or sent straight to the bottling machines. Automated lines fill glass or plastic bottles, usually between 250 milliliters and 1 liter. Each one is sealed, labeled, stamped with a date, and packed into boxes for shipping. But a lot of molasses is not meant for the kitchen. Large amounts are sent out in bulk. Food companies use it in baked goods, sauces, and cereals. Farms mix it into feed for cows and horses. Distilleries turn it into rum or fuel alcohol. Some factories even use it as a biofuel to power equipment. To move all that molasses, trucks carry it in heated tanks so it stays liquid during the trip. And if you are wondering, yes, molasses can spoil if it is not stored properly, but if kept sealed and in a cool place, it can last more than two years. Molasses has a surprisingly deep and sticky history. Back in the 1600s and 1700s, it played a key role in the triangular trade between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Sugar plantations in the Caribbean produced massive amounts of molasses. That molasses was sent to the American colonies where it was turned into rum. The rum was then shipped across the ocean and used in trade deals around the world. In some ports, molasses was once so valuable that it was worth more than gold. It was also taxed heavily, and those taxes caused protests that helped lead to the American Revolution. And then there is the Boston Molasses Disaster of 1919. A huge storage tank in the city burst and spilled over 2 million gallons of molasses into the streets. The wave was so fast and heavy, it knocked down buildings and sadly killed 21 people. Today, we mostly see molasses as a simple ingredient in our kitchens, but its impact on history, trade, and even revolutions is something we should not forget. Whether you like blackstrap for its minerals or prefer fancy molasses for its taste, every spoonful carries a mix of science, craftsmanship, and centuries of global history. Now, let's answer that question from earlier. What strange ingredient was once used to clarify sugar juice before lime? Believe it or not, it was cow's blood. In the 1600s and 1700s, some sugar refineries used dried animal blood to help remove impurities. The proteins helped trap particles, but thankfully we have moved far beyond that method today. If you learned something new today, hit that like button and subscribe. We have more factory stories, food science, and unexpected history coming your way. Did you know 54% of foods you eat are hiding a sweet secret? That's right, corn syrup. This sneaky little sweetener that's found its way into almost everything, from the jam on your toast to the buttery croissant you crave every morning. But have you ever wondered how something so simple becomes so irresistible? How did this sweet magic make its way into your favorite treats? Corn syrup is often used as a substitute for another popular sweetener. Can you guess what it is? Buckle up, because we're about to uncover the mind-blowing story behind corn syrup. A journey that starts in the golden cornfields and ends in the sweet syrup hiding in your favorite snacks. Trust us, you won't want to miss this. Step 1. Harvesting and Receiving the Corn Let's head to the cornfields, where the journey of fresh corn begins. Harvesting typically starts in late summer to early fall, timed perfectly to ensure the corn is at its ripest. Massive combine harvesters take over the fields, working efficiently to cut down stalks, strip the ears of corn, and separate them from the cobs, all in a single seamless process. Once harvested, the kernels are transported to drying facilities, where they are carefully dried to reduce their moisture content to about 14%, the ideal level for safe storage and transport. Timing here is extremely important. Too much moisture and the corn risks mold. Too little and the kernels crack during handling. Farmers closely monitor weather conditions during this stage, 
ensuring they harvest under dry skies to prevent excess moisture. After drying, the corn is stored in temperature-controlled silos, preserving freshness until it's loaded onto trucks, trains, or barges. From here, it's off to wet corn mills. Don't blink, because the journey's just beginning. Hit that like, share, and subscribe button to keep following the journey. Step 2. Cleaning the Corn Kernels Now we're at the wet corn mills, where all that freshly picked corn rolls in. But wait, before we get to the good stuff, we've got to make sure the kernels are spotless. These kernels have been through the fields, so they're bringing along dirt, sticks, and maybe even a little metal from the harvesting equipment. Not exactly what you want in your corn syrup. So, how do we get rid of all these impurities? These vibrating screens shake the kernels so that larger debris like stones, twigs, and cob fragments fall through the mesh, while the clean kernels move on. Once the heavier contaminants are removed, the kernels move into air classifiers, where carefully controlled streams of air blow away lighter impurities, such as dust, husks, and chaff. To tackle hidden dangers, powerful industrial magnets sweep through, capturing any stray metal fragments, such as screws or nails, that could compromise the process. By the time we're done, we have perfectly clean, ready-to-go kernels. Step 3. Soaking the kernels in steep tanks Now it's time for the kernels to enjoy a long, luxurious soak in something called a steep tank. Think of it as the spa treatment of the corn world. These giant stainless steel tanks can hold a whopping 168,000 pounds of kernels. But this soak isn't just for relaxation. It's a carefully controlled process to turn tough, dry kernels into soft, ready-to-process gems. Here's how it works. Warm water mixed with a bit of sulfur dioxide circulates through the tank, creating a weak sulfurous acid solution. This step helps break down the bonds between the kernel's components, making it easier to separate them later. Think of it like softening the glue that holds everything together. The soak softens the kernels, which makes the next step of the process much easier. This process isn't rushed, so it takes about 20 to 40 hours, during which the kernels absorb water, swelling up by at least 50% of their original size and soften, much like soaking dry beans while you're cooking them. Once they've absorbed the water and softened up, they're ready to be broken down into all the sweet components that make corn syrup so tasty. Step 4. Grinding and Separating the Germ After the soaking process is where the real action begins. The softened kernels go to grinding mills, where they're carefully broken apart. And here's the key. We keep the germ, the tiny, nutrient-rich core of the corn kernel intact, because it contains valuable corn oil. Next, the pulp goes into a cyclone separator, a spinning machine that separates the lighter germ from the heavier starch and fiber. Once separated, the germ is washed and pressed, releasing that golden corn oil we all know and love, used everywhere, from sizzling frying pans to industrial products. Did you know, from 100 pounds of corn, we get about 4 pounds of germ, which produces up to 1.5 pounds of oil. So, not only are we getting closer to making corn syrup, but nothing goes to waste. How cool is that? Step 5. Separating and purifying the starch Now that the germ is removed, what's left is a slurry of starch, protein, and fiber. The fiber is washed out and dried to be repurposed as animal feed or corn brand fiber in cereals. The protein, also called gluten, is separated using centrifuges. The final product is pure starch, which will now play a key role in the syrup-making process. Now, the pure starch is filtered and washed up to 14 times, making it over 99.5% pure. At this point, some of the starch is packaged and sold as cornstarch, which you often use in cooking or baking delicious desserts. But the majority of the purified starch goes on to become corn syrup, and this is where things start getting really sweet. Step 6. Converting starch to corn syrup here it is, the big moment we've all been waiting for. The starch is finally transformed into syrup through a process called acid hydrolysis. In simpler terms, the wet starch is mixed with a weak acid and heated, breaking it down into simpler sugars. But how does this affect the syrup's sweetness? It all comes down to timing. The longer the process runs, 
the more starch gets converted into sugars, making the syrup sweeter. Once the desired level of sweetness is achieved, the mixture goes through filtration to remove impurities, clarification to refine it further, and evaporation to remove excess water. And just like that, you have pure liquid corn syrup ready to sweeten the world. Step 7. Creating High Fructose Corn Syrup Hold up, we're not done yet. If you're making soda, candy, or desserts that need that extra sweet punch, corn syrup gets a little extra treatment. Enzymes are added to break down the sugars further, converting some of the glucose into fructose. This makes the syrup much sweeter and more potent. The enzymes work best at a specific temperature range, usually around 140 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and in a carefully controlled pH environment, ranging from 4 to 6.5 to get the perfect balance of sweetness. Once it's done, you've got high fructose corn syrup, which is about 42% fructose and way sweeter than regular corn syrup. That's why your soft drinks taste even sweeter. Isn't it crazy how much goes into making the syrup sweeter and sweeter? Step 8. Final Distribution and Retail Once packaged, these sweeteners are sent to food manufacturers and retailers across the globe. Trucks, trains, and tankers are used to transport over 30 million tons of corn syrup annually to ensure it reaches shelves everywhere, from small local shops to large multinational chains. Corn syrup's real magic is its versatility. It sneaks into everything from fizzy drinks and baked goods to savory sauces. High fructose corn syrup, with its extra sweetness, is a favorite in sodas and candies. It's no wonder these products have become staples in so many recipes. Next time you're at the store, take a second to glance at the ingredient list of your favorite snacks or drinks. Chances are, this sweet addition has traveled quite a journey to end up in your hands. From the cornfields, through a high-tech process, and into products we use every day. Pretty wild when you think about it, right? And there you have it. The incredible journey of corn syrup. From the fields to your kitchen shelves. Remember that question at the beginning? What popular sweetener is often substituted for corn syrup? If you guessed honey is the popular sweetener corn syrup often substitutes, you nailed it! So, next time you enjoy a fizzy soda or a sweet treat, take a moment to appreciate the innovation behind it. Got ideas for our next food deep dive? Let us know in the comments! Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share for more fascinating food journeys! Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video!